today we're going to talk about GUI. Right? G-U-I is the acronym and it stands for Graphical User Interface. So SuperGlider is a text-based programming language, but um, it does have a library of GUI classes and it's very capable when it comes to building graphical interfaces. There are a lot of projects in SuperCollider that I think don't really benefit from a graphical user interface, particularly kind of live coding performance stuff, where the GUI is just kind of an extra layer that sort of gets in the way. It's just extra work coding it, and then it's kind of extra work learning how to perform with it. But there are lots of other cases when a GUI is kind of essential. Um, like if you're making something which is going to be sent to people who don't know stuff about code. You know, it's good. It's a nice way to put something in front of the code that invites exploration and you know use and just kind of highlights the natural functions uh, of a program while concealing stuff you don't want people to see um, when you're emulating like a software or hardware thing it's also nice to have GUI tools and uh, it projects that do involve GUI I think that the GUI tends to take up a, a bunch of time there's a level of kind of pixel hunting that takes place and refining and picking the right colors and making sure all the behaviors are properly defined so it's not um, it's not nearly as easy as it is in like PD or Max MSP or one of these audio programming languages where the the GUI is the code I mean, there's really not that much difference you're actually creating a visual flow of objects and when you're done you kind of basically have your GUI in addition to your code so um, but that's that's kind of the nature of the beast with um, text-based programming languages if you want to make a very stylish GUI you just have to kind of put in the hours um, all right so SuperCollider has kind of an interesting history with GUI. Uh, I don't know the exact year, but somewhere around 2015-ish and before, there was a fairly cumbersome uh, uh, mishmash of, of GUI classes, which were kind of all different, like platform specific. There were multiple GUI kits that were supported, and there was a redirect system so that when you specified a GUI object, kind of what happened under the hood was that it would use the appropriate GUI object for your kit. And as a result, there were you know, some cross-platform discrepancies. Not every object was defined for every platform. Uh, and there are some examples floating around on the internet which uh, were created before, you know, in this, in this earlier time. And you might try to run it and it just won't work. You know, let's say class not defined or something like that. But since then, uh, the development community has worked very hard and successfully to make uh, Qt GUI, Qt, I think it's pronounced Qt, the, a kit which is supported on all three main platforms, Mac, Windows, and Linux. And so the redirect system is kind of deprecated now. It, you don't have to really worry about it. And it just, it's nice now because the, the process of working with GUI is much more uniform. And pretty much anything you write on one operating system, you can move it to another operating system, and it'll work just fine. It's just a little little anecdote there. So uh, let's make a GUI. And GUIs begin with a window, which we create with the window class. There we go. We made a window. <laughs> but where is it? Uh, windows, when you create them, are invisible by default. And we have to tell them to appear and become frontmost using the front message. There we go. We have made a window. Uh, if we run this code again, we get another one and another one. And they're actually all here. And they're all named W, but if we try to uh, use code to close these, uh, it only closes the most recent one. So one thing I like to do at the beginning of GUI code is um, use the class method, close all. This is a class message which says, if there are any windows, this includes things like the, the meters, the scope, anything like that. Uh, if we say close all, it's going to close them all and move on with the code. And this is just a nice way of avoiding buildup of windows, which is kind of annoying sometimes. It's, it's something I like to do. I don't know if there's a better way. There might be a better way to deal with the clutter, but that's what I do. Okay, so this window is pretty simple. Here it is in the middle of our screen. Um, when we create a new window, there's a couple of things we can do. We can provide the name of the window, and this is the string that's going to appear in the title bar. Sometimes GUIs involve multiple windows. It's good if they have titles, you know, which one is which. 
and um, uh, something called bounds. And bounds uh, determines the position and size of the window on your screen. And it's specified using uh, an object called rect, which is short for rectangle. And it's just a class which defines a rectangular space with a location and dimensions. There are four values involved. Uh, distance from the left side of the screen. A distance, technically this is from the, the bottom of the screen. These, these names are a little misleading. Uh, basically, the, the first two numbers are values in pixels uh, measured from the bottom left corner of your screen. So we can say 100 pixels from the left and 200 pixels from the bottom. And then we have a width and a height, which is the size of the window. So 300, 400. Those are all measured in pixels. So we have uh, 100 pixels from the left, 200 from the bottom, uh, 300 wide, and 400 tall. Another thing I like to do with Windows, especially when I'm developing, you know, I find it really annoying that we have our window, and then we start typing code, and then we have to just constantly do this and switch back and forth. If you have two, two displays, you know, that's a good way to deal with it. But uh, what I like to do is say, uh, tell the window to always be on top. So now if we go back to the code, we can still type and mess with the code and still see the window. It's not the topmost window, but it is floating on the top. It's not in focus, but it's topmost. Yeah, and so this always on top is, is a, uh, it's, it's a method, right? it's a method call, just like front is a method call and new is a method call and close. But you can also think of always on top as an attribute, some feature of the window, and it has some value associated with it. And so in this, in this line here on line four, we are setting the always on top attribute of the window. <clears throat> That's what this little underscore means. We'll, get, we'll talk about setting and, and getting in just, just a second. Uh, one thing that comes up with Windows, like if I have a really big screen, you know, sort of a 1080p, you know, tons and tons of pixels, uh, I may end up putting a window that works on my screen, but then if I send it to somebody with a really tiny screen, it might end up kind of off the screen somewhere. So it's really nice to be able to specify size and placement uh, based on the size of the current screen. And the way we do that is with uh, the class method window.screenBounds. And this returns a rect that represents the size of my screen. So if we were to make a window with these boundaries, it would take up the entire screen. It would be zero pixels from the bottom left, and it would be the full width and height of the screen. So we can use some of rect's methods to manipulate this screen bounds rect in order to, for example, always make sure something is in the center of the screen. So uh, let's try to do that. Uh, so we will say it's the name of the window and the rect. And so here, uh, we, can, we can keep the, we'll put something, something, uh, 300, 400. So we'll keep the size the same. And so the question is, how many pixels do we need to shove over the, you know, the left side of the window so that this 300 pixel wide window is in the middle of the screen, sort of horizontally? And that looks like this. Um, Window.screenBound. So this is a rect, right? And so we want to say, what is your height? And height is a rect method. Sorry, w uh, width, what am I doing? Width is what we want. We can say rect, what is your width? Then it returns its width value. And so uh, then I think what we want to do is, is cut this in half so that now this is basically a, half the pixels across the screen, 720. And then we want to subtract half the width of the window. Right. And we do a similar thing for the position from the bottom of the screen where we say cut the height in half and bring it up half the height of the window. And there we go, always right in the middle of the screen. Um, 
there's lots of really useful methods in the rect file. Uh, per, so you just accessing sort of the various, you know, left, uh, left top, right, bottom, the, these four numbers. Uh, oh, sorry, left, what is it, left top and uh, width and height. And there's also modification methods like move by a particular amount horizontally and vertically in pixels, uh, resize, uh, inset is very nice. Let's actually uh, mess with this, um, the Windows bounds. So we can say w dot bounds. And we're just access. This is you know bounds is a method which is defined for Windows, and the value returned is the rect that is the current position of that window. And in fact, if we move this somewhere over here and say bounds, it's a different different rect. Right? The the uh, horizontal and vertical position has changed, and we can set this to a new rect. We can, uh, you know, go back to our original version. Just move it right over here. And we can also express a new bounds in terms of the previous bounds. Uh, so we're going to inset the bounds by 30 pixels. It's going to, I think, shrink by 30 pixels. Yeah. And keep doing it. Don't do it. <laughs> Yeah, and we're, we're dancing around a, a topic here, which is um, getting and setting. Uh, windows and all of the GUI objects that live on a window have a number of attributes, you know, whether it's visible, what its boundaries are, what its background color is, what its value is, all sorts of things, right? Things which define that particular object's existence. And we can get any of those attributes by just calling the appropriate method. And what's returned to us is that attribute's value. And we can also set an attribute to be something new by using this underscore syntax and then providing in parentheses the new value for that attribute. And this kind of defines so much of working with GUIs because we have you know sliders and buttons and knobs and they're all supposed to do certain things and when you turn them they maybe influence other GUI objects or, or they need to update themselves. Um, you know, to reflect some sound that's happening. It's just the list goes on and on. And it all kind of boils down to uh, getting and setting. And we need to know your value or we need to change your value. Getting and setting. And it all just kind of looks like this. Okay, let's talk about views. A view is a class which we don't really use directly most of the time, but it is the parent class of all GUI objects like buttons, knobs, sliders. Uh, and so sometimes we'll use the word view to just refer to GUI objects of any kind. Um, uh, and so view defines a lot of the attributes that are common to all of its subclasses, like, um, uh, Visible. It's a good one. Is the you know is it invisible or not, or um, bounds? What are its bounds? Uh, let's see. I think I mentioned. Yeah, resizing. But in addition to all of the methods defined by view, which all subclasses inherit, individual view objects like knobs faders, buttons, text views, number boxes, they also have their own set of unique methods which, which they understand. Like, for example, you can um, ask for um, the, uh, you know, the string displayed on a, a text object. You can say, you know, dot string to get the current text. But that doesn't make sense for a slider because sliders don't have text. You can't say to a slider, give me your string. So some are specific to individual views and others are more general. And um, this is a case where I think the help files are actually pretty useful. When you're working with a knob or a slider, you want to know what can I do with this knob? How do I change its color? How do I make it, you know, horizontal instead of vertical? Stuff like that. You can look at the help file and it's all pretty much there. So let's put a slider on this window. Uh, and we're going to say uh, Views, place, you know, new views being created need two things. They need a parent. Basically, the view 
on which they live, right? They're, they're sort of uh, rectangular space on which they're being placed. And in this case, it's going to be the window. And a window is not technically a view, but in the cute GUI kit, there's no distinction between a window and a view. And in fact, when we have a window like this, this rectangular space is itself a type of view. It's called a, a top view, I believe. And we can say w.view, and it's a top view. So when we say put this slider on the window, we're saying technically the, the view on this window is, is the parent. And we need to provide some bounds. And there's a, a different behavior here with bounds. When we are placing a window on our screen, uh, the position is uh, measured from the bottom left corner of the screen. But when we're placing a view on a window, it's measured from the top left corner of the view. So this corner right here. And it's going to go over and down. So we'll say 40 pixels in, 20 pixels down, 30 pixels across, and 150 tall. There we go. So, right, 30 in, sorry, 40 in, 20 down, and then we have 30 wide and 150 tall. And it's a slider, and it moves. Uh, it doesn't do anything, but that's okay. We just created a basic slider. It has come into existence and doesn't really have any meaningful attributes at this point in time. Uh, but let's, let's give it some attributes. For example, background. Background is a, a method defined by view. So all, all views will respond to background. And it uh, represents the background color. So we can do something like this. Background color becomes white, blue, rand, random color. Uh, we can, uh, the, the usual, the way color is uh, by default represented is with uh, red, green, blue values, all on a normalized scale between 0 and 1. So uh, if we do no red, half green, all blue, it gives us this particular light blue color. Let's make this. Right? So 0, 0, 1, all blue, 0, 1, 0, all green, maybe half green. You know, so you can do it like this. There's also uh, new 255. And actually, what I like to do sometimes is um, just open up like a text editor or just some, some sort of color palette here. And you can move these sliders around to adjust the red, green, blue. And then over here, you can see the amount of red on a scale between 0 to 255, the amount of green, and the amount of uh, blue. And so you can just put these in here 34, 78, 160. And then we get that blue flavor. Yeah. Uh, you can also think in terms of hexadecimal values, this uh, six character hex code. And that is done with, um, let's make a new color here uh, CEBA3D. Let's say new, new hex, no, 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 from hex string. And I think we just, what was it? CEBA three D. Lots of different ways to think about color. Uh, and and background is the attribute which contains the color information for the background of that object. Uh, I think let's look at the slider help file. See what else is in here. Like if I want to change the this the color of this little black thing in the middle, like the, I think that's called the thumb. Oh, knob color. Knob color, the color of the handle. So all we're doing here is just setting. And if we ever want to know the color, we just ask for that value. You know, full combination of blue and green gives us cyan. I think it looks kind of hideous, actually. <laughs> let's just let's get rid of it. All right. So tons of attributes, it's really impractical to try to list them all because all GUI objects are kind of different. But the syntax 
for interacting with these attributes is the same. Just call the method, and if you want, you can put an underscore and set it to a new value. Getting and setting. So let's now talk about values and actions. Most GUI objects have a value. It's just another attribute, and we can get the value. This one is a value of zero, but if we move this slider and get the value, we get a new value. So in the case of sliders and knobs and sort of these continuous things like that, the, knob, the, the, the value is just a, a value between zero and one. Um, and as you can probably guess, we can also set this to be a particular value. And uh, let's put another object on here. I'll say, let's make a button. So now we have button. And let's, let's give it some states. Let's give, make it a two state. These buttons can have any number of states. I think by default it just has the one, so it's sort of like you push it and an action happens. And, you know, same thing every time. But let's make it like an on-off button. And we do that with the states attribute. And states is an array containing uh, a certain number of internal arrays. Each one represents a particular state. So this array contains information on state 0, and this one is state 1. And we need a string, so we'll say just the number 0. Uh, some color got blue, red, just so we can see. It's not going to look pretty. But... OK, so the, basically the string that is displayed in this state. Um, and then I, I always mix these up. One of these is the background color. One of these is the text color. So now we have a two-state button. This is state 0. The, this is the text color and the background color. And then in state 1, this is the string, the text color, and the background color. And if we say uh, btn.value, it gives us the value of the state. And right now, this button is in state 1. If we click it and ask for the value, now it's in state 0. So things like buttons. Uh, pop-up menus, uh, like lists of items where you can select one thing. The value of those objects is the thing that's currently selected or active. But for sliders and knobs, the value is the value, like how high or low it is. So those are values. This is a, a thing we, one of the most common things we use in GUIs. You know, if we want to use a knob to control the frequency of something, we need to know the value of that knob so we can convert it to the appropriate frequency value. So that's values. An action is a function which is evaluated uh, when that GUI object is interacted with. And I'm going to take this and bring it down here, copy it. And there's a couple of things. Before we, first of all, you can, um, you can chain these methods together, which I think is really nice. You say, make a new window. And then before even putting a semicolon, you just say, always on top and dot front. And the, the spacing here is, is up to you. You can do it this way if you like. Just kind of put them all. So we make a window, and then we chain together always on top is true, and make it front. We can do the same thing with this button. So it's states. The way I like to format this is with a return character. You know, something like this, probably. And so the, the thing to observe here is that this is all one statement. Uh, it's window.new, we provide the information for new, and then no semicolon, because we're not done, and chain always on top, make that true, and chain front, and when we're done, semicolon. So I've done something similar with the buttons. We have states. Let's give the button an action. Very simple action here. Whenever we interact with the button, this function will be evaluated. Right. 
Uh, we could do something similar with the slider. So every time we interact with this object, that action function gets called. And this is like, you know, not a very useful action function, but it does demonstrate what's going on here. Often we, you know, pretty much all the, all the time, we want the value of the GUI object to be involved in the action. So we do that by declaring an argument. And whatever we call this argument represents the instance of the GUI object itself. So in this case, view is this slider. So we can say view.value.postLN. Every time we call the action, we post the value of that slider. We can do the same thing here. Right. And now we're kind of in really good shape because if we have some sound going, then uh, you know we could just use this as uh, an amplitude control. Right, we just made a sound using the default synth, and uh, we will change this uh, action to be. Uh, yeah, forgot a semicolon. There we go. Volume slider. Uh, we could also use this button to turn it on and off, maybe. So we will say, um, you know, basically we want to turn it on if the if the button is has moved from zero into state one. That's our on cue, and then this should turn it off. So we can do something like uh, good old conditional logic, all the way back to like homework one or two or something. So that looks good, right? When the view, when the view's value is one, that means we're in state one. So create a synth, give it a name, and if the value goes into state zero, we'll set its gate to be zero. It's working. It's not great because this slider's all the way down. So you know, really, what we want is when we turn this on, it should start playing with an amplitude of zero. Because as soon as we move this. It sort of jumps. There's a discontinuity in the amplitude. So what we can do is say amp uh, sl dot value. Right when we create the synth, look at the value of the slider and use that as the starting amplitude. Making sense so far? Um, OK. Uh, let's make a frequency slider. Add a frequency slider to this so we can control the frequency as well. And this is, uh, let's use a knob just for variety, right? Um, uh, okay, I'm going to try to put it right under this button in a way that looks nice, but because we're closing all windows every time we run this and creating a new window, it's actually very easy to nudge these around if you sort of have your workflow set up right. So I'm just going to guess 100, 70, uh, we'll do 50 and 50. Yeah, so there it is. That looks pretty good. But if we wanted to move it down, we could just change this to an 80, reevaluate, 90, 
and then so it's, it's really very easy to move things around um, especially if you do this always on top trick you can very easily see what you're doing uh, I think did 60 look good yeah that looks fine um, okay so it doesn't do anything right now knobs have a bunch of different attributes the ones we haven't seen so far I think there's one attribute which determines the um, mode of interaction right now it's rotational so like you have to actually move the mouse around in a circle but there are other modes where you click and drag up and down to move it around. And I want to uh, see what that is. Yeah, mode. Mode is the name of this method. The way the value is controlled with respect to mouse movement. So round is the default. There's also horiz and vert. So we can say mode. So now, moving the mouse up and down. So it's you know personal preference. Do whatever you like. Uh, let's see, I think I actually do prefer rotary in this case. So that's what we'll do. All right. So we can't use these values in their current state because they're between zero and one. Right. These are not good frequency values. So one option is to use something like linexp to map the value from its linear range of 0 to 1 to an exponential frequency range of a desired value. There's also a class called control spec. which is um, an object which, you know, maps ranges from one to the other. Uh, I don't, I mean, I guess it does maybe in some cases provides a couple of benefits that Linux does not. But here's how it works. Um, call it uh, freak spec. Control spec. And we, we provide a minimum, a maximum. Uh, if we want it to be linear, exponential. And then there's some others which we don't really need to worry about too much. And so now we can say uh, freak spec dot map knob dot value. And that gives us, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to do the mapping for us. You can also say uh, freak spec equals so the symbol freak dot as spec. Because there's a lot of built in control spec objects. And I think you can see those with spec dot specs dot keys. I mean, just like the post each one of these. So these are the symbols you can use for different specs. There's an amplitude spec, a decibel spec, uh, reciprocal quality spec for like filters and stuff. Uh, I don't, you know, I honestly don't use control spec too often, but um, I do know that there's a, a frequency spec which is predefined so that. That works as well. You know, and we can even now change the knob. Uh, I guess let's let's put this uh, in here, and then we'll say uh, when the knob is interacted with. Um, post the actual frequency. So now we have a knob which is sort of converting these values appropriately. So we are uh, just about ready, I think, to um, add this uh, frequency functionality. Just trying to Clear my head here. So okay, let's uh, oh, we'll, we'll put it in the in the button the buttons function. Right? So we're gonna say freak uh, I think that's what we want. 
Yeah, it's our current value. So when we create the synth, it has the frequency corresponding to the current position of the knob, and it also has an amplitude corresponding to the current position of that amplitude uh, slider. The slider is already performing its appropriate job by setting the uh, amplitude. And the button is doing what it needs to do. So we just need to update the action of the knob. And I'm just going to copy this and change it. So whenever the knob is moved, uh, we uh, set the frequency to be the mapped value of this knob. In fact, we can just put view here because we're inside the knobs function. Uh, either is fine. They all have these global names, but we can also refer to them in the context of their own action function. So uh, we're going to boot the server because I guess we uh, quit it earlier from rebooting the interpreter. And let's try it. And there's one last problem I'm sort of seeing here, because what happens if we move the knob or the slider now? You get this. Right? Because it's trying to talk to the synth that does not exist, because by going into state zero, we freed it, and away it goes. So the general solution here is to include in the action functions of these frequency and amplitude setting GUIs some conditional logic that checks if the synth exists before trying to talk to it. And the trick that I like to do here is it's a, it's a method associated with the class called node watcher. Uh, basically, this, this allows us to, when we create a synth, we can register it with a node watcher, which allows us to then say, is it playing or not? So that, that simply looks like this. We go into the... Um, We go to the synth, right? here's this, the actual creation of the synth, and we say dot register. That's all we have to do. And then, before we actually set the parameter, we say if sin is playing, then go ahead and set its value. Otherwise, do nothing. Let's do that down here as well. So no more of those. It's still posting itself because we have a, a very verbose, you know, we have we still have this line here. We can get rid of that, I suppose. And we can get rid of that as well. So we have a basic GUI here. And uh, you know, it's not, it's not doing a whole lot, and it took us quite a while to get here. So just, I guess, kind of reinforcing what I said. It does, does take some time to make a really fancy, sophisticated GUI. Uh, we talked about values and actions. And there is a method. Uh, we know the method value just sort of retrieves or sets the value. But there's also value action. So if we say button.value, we can see it's in state 0. And we can set it to be in state 1. But this is a passive method here. It just updates the value of the object, does not actually call its action. And this is kind of you know, not a great thing to do in this particular case, because we're putting the button in a state that is out of sync with its action. So let's bring it back to 0. There is also value action. This sets the value of the GUI receiving the message and also performs its action passing in the newly updated value. So here we're just, it's a code substitute for actually clicking on the button. We're saying change your value and do your action. We can do the same thing with the, um, 
you know, the knob. It's a great example of exponential, linear exponential stuff, right? We're changing this linearly, and uh, we get an exponential change in frequency, a bunch of octaves. So it's possible to invoke these actions, change values, and manipulate GUI objects without you touching the mouse at all. Right? And this is actually um, you know, necessary in some cases. You might have a slider and a number box below it, and they actually represent the same value. So as you move the slider, you'd want it to uh, call value on the number box. And as you move the, change the number box, you want it to call value on the slider so that they are sort of always in sync, no matter which one you're adjusting. But you don't want them to call value action on each other, because then as soon as you touch one of them, you get stuck in a feedback loop and superclutter crashes, because they both each one calls action on the other one, and then it goes seesaws back and forth, back and forth forever. Okay. Well, uh, unfortunately, there was some really cool stuff that I wanted to get to. I wanted to talk about uh, drawing and animation, so uh, I think we'll do that next time. But I do think we've covered enough for the uh, homework, and I think this is going to be the last homework I'll assign this semester. Uh, basically, I, I want you to make a tic-tac-toe using a 3x3 three three grid. Of, you can do it with buttons, you can do it with other objects, but you know, it should just be a, a simple tic-tac-toe game. So it's going to involve uh, buttons that initially have three states, right? blank, X, or O, and then you know, depending on who goes first, then you have to change the states of the buttons because you know, one, once one has been picked, you know, it's uh, uh, the, you know, when you click another button, it should go to O instead of X. And so it involves a bit of, you know, planning. And um, so do, this one's, this is kind of a, this is like a mini project, basically. It's, it's more, more than just a couple of simple questions. So do, do yourself a favor and actually read this and, and get started early. It's, it's going to be something that might take a little bit of time. But, of course, feel free to, uh, you know, if you get stuck, be happy to provide a little bit of help. On that. Okay. All right. Well, I think we'll do some more GUI stuff uh, next week, and you know maybe we'll move on from that if we don't take the whole class. So, um, yeah, that'll be it. I'll see you all next week, and send me your uh, final project proposals. <laughs>